So Baxter, thanks for coming up today uh, to, to speak to us uh, today and tomorrow, actually two, two days, uh, ten, 10 hours, full lectures, full on as you would say, uh, for Global Grace Online Seminary. It's the beginning of uh, uh, a certificate, uh, I believe, isn't it? Master's in Trinitarian Theology. Wow. And it's going to start here today. These are going to be the first 10 hours, um, compressing an awful lot, but I'm trying to draw people in to realize what happened in the early church and what in fact went on in the early church and in the apostles is going on inside of each, each person, each human being. And that's what blows my mind and, and so thrills me. So I want to compress 10 hours together uh, in as beautiful a way as I can so we can, okay, now we got to talk about this. This is too beautiful. We, we just got to talk about this. So then we can stop and slow down and do some and look at this a little bit more carefully. Go back and look at Athanasius and see what he wrote and bring people in like Brad Jerzak or, or John McMurray or uh, Francois de Toy or <clears throat> Jim Sawyer, who's a historical uh, theologian who knows the, the details. But right now we don't need the details right now. We need the vision that takes our breath away. And we sit in wonder with the apostles at who Jesus really is and what's really happened and how big and beautiful this is. And, and, and we weep and we're moved and we're having our minds blown. And that's right where the early church was. And then we can go back and look at the history and think about it and see what it means for us today. See how far we got off base. All these questions. And, you know, there's thousands of them. Uh, and be able to have time over 72 hours of interviews and discussions and teaching to be able to look at this uh, gospel of the triune God the way it should be looked at. Uh, not just abstractly or intellectually, but, but as people who are caught up in this because this is our life. And that sense of wonder and, and that sense of worship in the midst of this because we're talking about God and God's love for us. We're talking about the Father, Son, and Spirit and the dream for the human race and how that's come to fruition in Jesus. And these brothers and sisters saw it and they did this magisterial uh, work of helping us to begin to conceive of this. And it's just, it's taken us 2,000 years to begin to realize that what was going on in the early church was important. And that's where we are right now in history to, in the year 2017. And here's one of the best places on earth, Medivale uh, Church in Mississauga. It's one of my favorite places on the planet because of the spirit, because of the people, because of the life, because of the hunger. And um, I even like you, David. Well, that's not a bad place to start. <laughs> I have wanted to do an introduction to the Trinitarian faith. Not, not simply Trinitarian theology. It's, it's Trinitarian faith. And to be able to have 10 hours to draw on all those resources and bring that together. And I want, to, I, want, I want people to be gathered into the conversation because they realize this is not just about history. This is about me and my life. Because the very thing that was going on in the early church as the, as the, the Trinitarian big vision began to emerge inside of the apostles thinking and understanding, <clears throat> it's not just a vision. It's the unspeakable communion of the Father, Son, and Spirit that is within us seeking to express itself and almost uh, certainly embody itself in us and express itself in an infinite variety of ways in our humanity and our relationships and uh, on earth, in the kingdoms of the earth. So I wanted to be able to, gra you know, to gather the people to be able to see this with me and stand with me and see this and do it in 10 hours and then back off and say, okay, now. Now we're going to take 60, 70 hours and I'm going to do some interviews with scholars and I'm going to do some interviews with pastors, interviews with friends about different components of this and, and then get some of these men and women to do lectures on some of the details. But this series that we're doing here is about that, ten, that introductory vision of what happened in the early church. What, how did this come about? And it sets up all kinds of questions like, well, if this is what's going on in the early Christianity, what happened to us? How did we get so far off base? So these are parts of the questions that we'll be exploring later on uh, as we move through all 72 hours. And your, and your approach is really, is, is, con is really conversational and you really do, you know, I, I feel that that's been others. one of the great weaknesses of, of theological education. It's all in the head. It's right. like my information to your information and it's not. It's really about worship. It's about being drawn into the, the fellowship of the Father, Son, and Spirit and celebration. And we talk about it. And we realize 
They've, our brothers and sisters have been talking about this for over 2,000 years. We have this rich heresy, I mean, rich heritage of, of, of the cloud of witnesses. And, and, and at the risk of sounding trite, it's relational. Mm -hmm. And if it's truly relational, that changes everything. Yes. Well, everyone is included in it. That's the, the, the heart of the gospel is that before the foundation of the world, the Father, Son, and Spirit set their love upon us us being all of the human race, created us in Jesus, and now in Jesus has come to find us, uh, not just in our humanity, but come to find us inside of our own sin and our darkness, and in fact, our iniquity, where we have rejected God. That's the whole move of the biblical story, is that my, my people that I have created, Jesus, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite lines from Athanasius is, what then is God being good to do? when his creation is on the road to ruin and lapsing into non-being. And that changed, that, that really uh, 35 years ago began to rattle my, my cage in terms of my basic theological vision of God. Because for Athanasius, God is good. Not on Monday and Tuesday, but is good. And what is this God who is good to do when his creation and his dreams for the human race are on the road to ruin? And so I've taken that statement and and added another uh, and said, what then is Jesus to do when his creation, when his bride is so trapped in such a gnarled and profoundly bizarre way of thinking and seeing that we actually run from Jesus and run from the light and don't want anything to do with him or his father or the Holy Spirit. What then is this Jesus who has these dreams of sharing his, his life in relationship and communion and fellowship and anointing in the Holy Spirit and his relationship with his Father with us, what's he to do? Is he to throw up his hands? Or does he do exactly what we see the story says he does? And so the word becomes flesh. He's going to find his way inside the gnarled mass. He's going to get to the bottom of the abyss. And he's bringing his Father and the Holy Spirit with him. And every one of us are included in this. But is, isn't there a sense that that's if I'm still living in my head, which, you know, we both can smile about uh, on a variety of levels, because so many of us are, you know, having studied philosophy and so on personally, but, you know, and my life's project is to bridge the head and the heart, you know, that we can't see that conclusion that you're trying to say. So when you're up here and you're, and you're teaching and you're lecturing and you're writing and so on, there's a sense in which that, that person or that approach can't actually see. It is a blindness that has been addressed, not theologically and not even scripturally. It's been addressed in person by God. In John 5, when Jesus squares off with the Pharisees, I think he's interpreting for us the nature of the fall. He looks, and I, and I like to think of Saul of Tarsus standing there. I don't know if that's, that's it's probably possible, but I, highly unlikely. But he looks at Saul of Tarsus, he looks at the Sanhedrin, he looks at the Pharisees, and he says in John 5, you have never heard the voice of God or seen his form at any time. And I think he takes a step closer and says, and you do not have the word of God abiding in your heart. And you are unwilling to come to me. This is the problem of the fall. Men hate the light, love the darkness, unwilling to come to Jesus, don't have the word of God abiding in their heart, and don't have the love of God in them. And I take a deep breath and I think I, I can imagine Jesus looking at the Pharisees and just sort of winking and says, give me three days because that's what I've come to address. I've come to address the real fall. And that is your unwillingness and your hatred of the light. And you don't ha you have rejected the word of God. So I'm going to get on the inside of that. And I'm going to do that by submitting myself to you in your brazen blindness and in your iniquity. And I'm bringing my Father and the Holy Spirit with me. That Trinitarian life has entered into the darkness by our permission because our vote was damn him to hell. And he said, okay. And in dying in our arms, he's entering into our iniquity and he's bringing his relationship and his anointing, his relationship with his Father and his anointing and the Holy Spirit with him. Now that changes everything about what's going on on earth. I've heard you say when John preaches the gospel, he starts with relationship. Now, some people who, who, who've grown up in a particular worldview or a particular, with a particular theological framework would go, of course he does, or I know those verses, or I understand that. But, but how, how might you respond to that? It's right there in the first five verses of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is face to face with God, and the Word is God. 
All things came into being through him. That's Jesus. That's the Father, Son, that's the Word. Not one thing came into being apart from him. Therefore, he is the source and the meaning of human existence. He is the light of our lives. Verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't understand. It can't conquer it, but doesn't understand it. That sets up the problem for John. It's not uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and God is holy and Adam and Eve botched it. And someone has got to pay for this and straighten out this mess. For John, it is we're included in this beautiful life of relationship between the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we don't know it. And not only do we not know it, we're miserable and broken and sad and overwhelmed internally with fear and and uh, projecting into the future and self-centeredness and narcissism. So he says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't understand. And so what then is the son being good to do? And so the word becomes flesh. He is going, he's going to bring his divine sonship, his relationship with his father, his anointing in the Holy Spirit. He is going to bring that not only into our anthropos, which is humanity, but into our sarks, which is flesh, which is our humanity and its twisted and broken um, perversion. And the apostle Paul goes even further. Not only anthropos, not only sarks, but harmatia, sin, iniquity. And that's the movement. And that's what John sees. That's the way he preaches the gospel. Because he knows that Jesus is on the inside of people. Because we killed him and he accepted that and he bring, comes right inside of our darkness. So when the gospel's proclaimed, something resonates here inside of people. That's a different thing than I've got to convince you intellectually, theologically, philosophically. Well, I came to give you life not the right argument. That's exactly right. I came to give you life. And so I think in our culture right now, um, we are coming right back around to the early church in the sense that we've done the argument thing and we've fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. And we've all got our favorite Bible verses and our theological arguments and all that. But people don't really care about that there because what they're after is who can lead us, me, who can lead me? Who can lead us to experience the life that Jesus promises on every page in the New Testament? That doesn't mean we're not going to think about it. I'm a theologian. I'm going to think about it as all I can. But it means that what we're after is that life. That's a different, a different way of going about talking and, and doing theology. You cannot be detached from that longing. And it, it, it changes the, the, the metaphysic. Yes. Right? And the hermeneutic. And the hermeneutic. It changes the way we look at it, the understanding of it, the interpretation of it, the foundation, right? Where the ground we're standing, the ground beneath our feet. Herein lies Professor Torrance's, T.F. Torrance's great phrase that is the epistemological relevance of the Hamusian. Mm. Hamusian being the, in the Can you spell Greek. any of those words, Baxter? <laughs> You're asking me if I... Um, that's Can, good, I, I, I want to read. I want to read something. H E. <laughs> and, and and we're going to talk about um, something that I think is kind of um, um, original to you, but the double homosian. We're right. going to we're going to talk about that before we before we hit stop. Double what? <laughs> I, I, can I may not be able to pronounce it, it, but I know how to I know how to spell it. It's not original with me. It's with a ph, isn't it? But, <laughs> oh, this is getting good now. Can, Are I, you can, I, can I read something from my, my original copy of The Great Dance? This is, this is like, look at this thing. This is, isn't this wonderful? Uh, so what is this? 2000. Um, 17 years ago. The Great Dance. Quote, think of a group of people trapped in a collapsed mind. And suppose that the rescue team only sets up shop on the surface and never actually goes down into the mine. What would be the point? There would be no rescue. The help would not reach the people trapped in the mine but turn the thought around. Suppose that the rescue team does go down into the mine, but loses contact with the surface crew. In that case, they too would be lost. It is necessary that we hold on to both sides of the truth. If Jesus ceases to be himself, the Father's beloved Son who lives in fellowship with the Father in the Spirit, then all is lost, for he has nothing to give us when he comes to us. If, on the other hand, he lives out his sonship with his Father, but does not do so inside Adam's skin, then his sonship does not reach us. The dance of life of the Trinity flies over our heads." Close quote. Is that what you've been going on about all these years? 
That is the inner logic of the cosmos. Uh, it is the hermeneutic of the Christian mind. It is what the early fathers were doing. They, their Irenaeus beautifully said it. Uh, Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, who in his transcendent love became what we are to bring us to be what he is in himself. Uh, there's two sides. He is the one who's face to face with the Father from all eternity. He is the one who's in the bosom of the Father. And he's going to find his way down inside the trapped mind without losing his fellowship with his Father or without losing his anointing in the Holy Spirit in order to find us in our great darkness. That's the mind. It's not just you know, physically, spatially lost. It is we are lost. Adam and Eve are hiding in the bushes from God and they think that's the, the normal and right thing to do. I mean, you're dealing with a profound blindness. So Jesus is going to bring his, his communion, his knowledge, his anointing in the Holy Spirit, his knowledge of the Father. He's going to bring that inside our darkness and pitch his tent there. That changes everything. So you, you have to hold on to both sides of the incarnation. If you lose the deity, then he may come to us, but he's, he may be a little bit more sophisticated than we are, but ultimately he's not God. But then if he becomes, a, if, he's, if he's fully God, as the creed and the early church insisted, then he also must be fully man, fully human. And it's even a little bit further than that. It's not just fully human, fully human trapped in the darkness. So you could go back uh, he had, the unassumed is the unhealed is what Gregory Nazianz and several others in the early church said. He has to come inside everything that's broken without ceasing to be who he is. And that's what he's done. And the early church realized, oh my goodness, when you say that, you have spoken volumes about the nature and character of God and God's vision for the human race. You've spoken volumes about who we are as human beings and where, the, where we came from and where we're going. And to unpack those volumes is the joy and the task and the uh, painful process uh, of Christian theology. That is the Trinitarian faith. It's, you, you packed it right in there. That's, that's actually pretty smart, man. You... <laughs> somebody tell you about that verse? That's I mean, right, that yeah, yeah. Uh, see, somebody, see, see Baxter Kruger, never heard of him. Why, why, do, why, do, why is it that so many people seem to have trouble with the perfect circle, with, with withdrawing that, 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 that embrace. That isn't, I mean, after this many years, you, you must, I don't know, you could probably come up with the 10 questions that I get asked all the time. Mm. And I wonder if, if you could, if people could just say, ah, yes, I, I, I am on the inside. I am embraced. I am included. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a huge question. Um, we have a problem in our Western family conversation because I don't think our default definition of God is the Father, Son, and Spirit. I think it's some being behind that that's holy and sovereign. Um, so for me in my journey is I've seen more and more that this is who God is for all eternity. It makes sense why this, cre this Father, Son, and Spirit creates. It flows right out of their relationship. They intend to share it with us and they take responsibility for what they've made and what we do in our darkness. And they still work to bring us in, back into this um, uh, relationship where we can come to know as Jesus. I mean, think of this. What do you think Jesus feels as the incarnate, crucified, resurrected and ascended son right now when he hears his father say you? are my beloved son in whom my soul delights. What does he feel? Is he anxious? Does he bite his fingernails? Is he scared about what the Pharisees think on earth? What is going on in his inner world in the Holy Spirit when he is face to face with his father? That's what he has given to us. Nothing less than that. So now we've moved from uh, God is angry and, and Jesus has to make a sacrifice so we're okay and we get a ticket if we believe to go to heaven when we die. We've moved to what the gift given to me is Jesus himself. That's what he's come to give us. He has to go down inside the mind to the very pit and he gives himself to us. And when he says, when he, says he gives himself, he, he, that means he's giving us his relationship with his father. We're, we, we are included in his anointing in the Holy Spirit. To be able to, to unpack that means that we have to untwist a whole lot in our Western philosophical and theological tradition. And we're not untwisting it like on our own. That was done in the early church. That was the, what the first four centuries was about. 
as the gospel of this God went out into the Mediterranean basin and beyond, it, it bumped into existing philosophies and paganism and worldviews, and it, it immediately began to be assimilated. And so the Jesus of the apostles was beginning to shrink. And they had to have a, uh, the first council of Nicaea. They called together to say, we're going to speak definitively about who Jesus is. And they, they realized those two things. If he's not homoousios to patri, of the same being as the Father, and if he's not homoousios with us, of the same being with us, then our salvation is lost on either way. But if he is, and that's what they confessed, is that in Jesus, God of God and light of light and humanity of humanity have come together in one person. And they said, we can't explain that, but we're going to defend it and hold on to it. And the inner logic of the cosmos is right there for us just to unpack. Uh, and that's really what's been going on for the last 2,000 years is that Trinitarian life in Jesus inside of us is pressing against our alienated minds and is saying, you got to rethink this, you got to rethink this. And we'd go down this rabbit trail and that rabbit trail and the Holy Spirit steadily brings us back around in these different... Uh, moments in history where it seems like we return to the vision of the apostles and the vision of Irenaeus and Athanasius in the early church. That's what that's what T.F. Tartz is trying to do in this magisterial book, The Trinitarian Faith. Oh, he does it. Um, it is a bit heady at points, but brilliant. Is this why you, you talk about repentance being a, a, a change in the way you see, essentially? This is, you know, this is about... Uh, uh, a worldview. This is about this is about epistemology. This is about how we know what we know. So, so in a sense, the early church kind of had it. Obviously, they didn't have a few other things, <laughs> but they had this, right? They had it. They had this starting point. Then you said, I think you said we bu we bumped up. We, they, they 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 bumped up against uh, uh, other worldviews and paganism and so on. It, it were other worldviews in their own minds. Other views of God in their own minds, and that's the battle. Is I boil the whole thing down to this. Jesus is saying, Baxter, I want you to take, because I'm on the inside of you now, like Saul of Tarsus. When he says on, in Galatians chapter 1, he says, When God who set me apart from my mother's womb was pleased to reveal his son in me, not to me, that's external, in me. Saul of Tarsus has an encounter with Jesus as the Father, Son, and Anointed One on the inside. Now he's got a reference point that he did not have in his darkness. And now he can begin to change his mind in the light of that encounter and that revelation in the spirit that's deeper than the mind. And in the West, what we've done is detached our mind from that encounter. And we've done our theology that way. And we buy into various different logics and hermeneutics and, and non-negotiables. And we work it out that way. But in the early church, what they realized is that they had experienced the baptism of the Spirit in their innermost being, the Spirit of Jesus and the Spirit of, of the Father. They, they had what T.F. Torrance, and I talk about this in the first lecture, T.F. Torrance calls uh, theological instinct, Michael Polanyi calls uh, intuitive tacit knowing. The scriptures say the, the Spirit's bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God in Jesus. The Spirit's bearing witness with our spirits that Jesus is the Father's eternal, eternal Son. So that's not irrational. That's rooted in the, in the logic of the cosmos. And so we are to bring our minds into serve, in the service of our hearts. And that's what was going on in the early church. They realized the staggering implications of Jesus' very existence as the Son of God incarnate inside our darkness. And the, the flash of light that that means for the whole uh, human race. And man, it, it's, it's so simple. And so magnificent and so beautiful. And so it's beyond words, but we must speak it. We must speak it. We must proclaim it. And it takes shape in the context of the worship of the church. And it reorients the mind. It restructures them. Be transformed, Paul said, by the renewal of your mind. And Hillary, in that magnificent, uh, uh, in the first lecture, this just uh, thrills me that Hillary is getting to speak again. He should have been the father of our Western tradition. Augustine got that crown. But Hillary said, we must be willing to expand our imaginations until they are worthy of the theme. The theme being the father-son relationship, the glory of God. We cannot force God into our constructs. We allow the Holy Spirit to blow apart the constructs and reconstruct them in the light of the truth that is already within us. 
That's simultaneously what was going on in the early church. And it's also everyone's journey on earth because they too have the Trinitarian life of God in their innermost being, in their darkness. And it's constantly calling out saying, you need to take sides with me. So Jesus is saying, take sides with me. Let me tell you who my father is. Let me tell you about the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you who your enemy is. And it's the reconstitution of our minds which allows that Trinitarian life to flourish and to flow in a multitude of directions both globally and corporately in terms of the education of the human race, but also personally. That's the same, uh, the same thing that was going on in Israel and in the apostles and in us today. And it will keep on going until the whole earth, until there is no darkness, until the mind of man has been reconstructed in the light of this communion.